Early in the history of research, scientists left their laboratories and embarked on voyages into the tropics, driven by a thirst for adventure and curiosity. The scientists filled herbaria with tropical plants, collected unknown insects and brought home exotic animals. Ethnologists were interested in the life of indigenous peoples. Partnerships with researchers of the host country were rather the exception than the rule. Above all, local helpers supported foreign researchers to cope with the challenges of the tropics. They were most probably unaware of the reason for the researchers being there. With the end of the colonial period in the 1960s, the era of catch-up development was proclaimed. This brought about a change in the allocation of roles between the researchers and their local helpers. The researchers from the north became helpers in the service of development, whereas the former local helpers became the beneficiaries of the research. Subsequently, in most new countries, research centers were created, to begin with, mainly in fields of medicine and agriculture. The establishment of these research centers was the starting point for research partnerships across national borders. But soon it became clear that building such partnerships on an equal footing is anything but easy. During the first few decades of development, transboundary research partnerships only played a secondary role. Technologies from the north and civil engineering were seen as key to development, and large investments in industry and transportation were at the top of development agendas. Water played a crucial role. It was essential for energy production as well as for large-scale irrigation the motor of the Green Revolution. Max Giger remembers these days from his own experience. In the 70s and 80s, he was involved in a number of dam and canal projects in Egypt and many other countries in the Global South. In those days, the, the, uh, people took little notion, as far as I'm concerned, about the downstream effects it had on the ecology as well as the farmers and the fishermen that were living from those resources. In the late 90s, Max Giga returned to Egypt. This time, however, the focus was not on the construction of heavy infrastructure. On behalf of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, Max Giga implemented water projects that aim to strengthen the sustainable use and fair distribution of water. We focused, among other areas, on Aswan area because uh, there was a dire need for uh, aid to socio-economic development and found that the Swiss had a project uh, whereby they renovated Sulzer pump bought in 1967 to improve the water supply. So the water supply was there. On the other hand, we also noticed that there were big problems uh, regarding the distribution and use of the water. So in short, we started backwards. We went back to the end of the canal and worked it upward uh, towards the entry. And were able, uh, uh, by means of uh, improving water distribution, land use, water savage, uh, as well as uh, leadership aspects of community leaders uh, to organize the use of waters and by legalizing these organizations so that they will be recognized by the state. And this uh, harmony was established and I think uh, it, it worked fine. Nowadays, development in general and development support in particular is not just about delivering more and better production factors, but equally important about the sustainable use and fair distribution of scarce resources. The construction of dams, pumps and canals is only part, maybe even only, 
the beginning of the true development story, which ends with the communities at the end of the canals. The changing understanding of the concept of development can also be observed in the policy agenda on a global level. In 2015, the community of states adopted the UN Agenda 2030 with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. These differ significantly from the UN Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, from the year 2000. Roland Schertenleib, former researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, ERWAG, explains the new agenda's broader perspective on sustainable development. In the MDGs, uh, water was mentioned just in two sub-goals and only related to the access to water supply and sanitation. Now in the Agenda 2030, we have a standalone goal on water, which is much more comprehensive, dealing with uh, water supply and sanitation as well, but uh, beyond that, it also talking about water as a resource, probably the most important and vital resource we are having. The fundamental change in the international discourse has also significantly changed research agendas and the way research is conducted in the water sector. Over time, research became more system oriented and holistic. You know, for many years, uh, the research agenda was dominated by engineering questions, how to transfer technologies from the north to the south, to implement uh, big uh, infrastructure like uh, irrigation systems or water supply and sanitation systems, large dam and so on. Then later, when one was more looking at water also as a resource, it was uh, very important to involve natural scientists as well. So the research became much more inter- and multidisciplinary. But this was not enough, actually. In order to really solve the problem on the ground, it was then obvious that we also have to involve social scientists to work with society, to work with people. So the research became uh, transdisciplinary. Reaching the SDGs, will be challenging and cause for research that not only provides relevant evidence, but also shows the spectrum of solutions to burning problems. As shown with the example of water through different periods, sustainable development can only be achieved in an effective, fair and equitable way when all concerned stakeholders are involved from the beginning of the process. This is also true of research. But why conduct research in a partnership which links research communities around the globe? Gladio CSA uses an example in the Ivory Coast to show what transboundary partnerships can achieve. The Swiss Centre for Scientific Research in Côte d'Ivoire has been founded in 1951. It evolved from a simple platform receiving Swiss researchers to a regional research center in West Africa, hosting more and more and bigger transparent partnerships and supporting sustainable development from local to global levels. Two examples of program has played a role in CSRS contribution to and the changes of research landscape in the region. The 12-year NCCR North House program, which helped the country in difficult times and strengthened CSRS in transboundary partnerships. The PASRES 10-year program, which was an external financial support that helped the country to set up, create in 2018, its own national funding body. Research partners had such impacts on policies, societies, and the SDGs if they succeed running for a long period of time, building on former achievements, building both capacities at individual and national level, 
following the 11 fair principle of KFP and broadening the partnership between science and policy. The CSRS belongs to a new generation of research institutions seeking a twofold partnership. On the one hand, partnerships among researchers from different regions and disciplines, and on the other, partnerships with stakeholders from the non-academic world. Policymakers, civil society and beneficiaries are invited to actively shape the agenda and to use and translate research findings into different contexts. We are, however, still in the initial stage of building these partnerships. So what are important milestones looking into the future? We ask this question to researchers working in such contexts. Global challenges require global research partnerships. Scientific knowledge needs to be increasingly produced at the global level, also to track progress towards the SDGs. If we look today at researchers who dedicate their time and their creativity to uh, SDG-relevant research, very often this is research that takes time, it's complex, it's not always rewarded with top, uh, top publications. So what they need is a financial incentives and scientific recognition for what they do. In the end of the day, the value of research is also defined by whether or not it corresponds to people's development needs and aspirations, as well as their desires for change. So this highlights the needs for researchers to be actively engaged in social change processes. As a researcher, I think we can only create a bigger impact with our research when we are able to transform our role from a conventional scientist to become an agent of change ourselves. Given that sustainable development can only be achieved in cooperation with developing countries, the world's community needs to heavily invest into knowledge capacities in the Global South. Only with these investments, it will be possible that developing countries can build up knowledge societies and can become partners on equal terms in the Global Policy Dialogue.